Welcome to The Reality Revolution. I'm your host, Brian Scott, and I am overjoyed today to read a magnificent lecture by Neville Goddard, this one called Conception. And I can't really explain it other than just to listen to it. It's about conception on this level and on the next level. And he's talking about vision becoming real in so many different ways. And it's a little bit different lecture by Neville Goddard. And we'll have to talk about it when we're done. So tonight's subject will be on conception, both on this level and on the highest level. The Bible is a vision from beginning to end. We use words like Jesus. We use words like Moses, Abraham, and Isaac. But it's a vision. The whole thing is a vision. So you will understand what I mean when I will say Jesus said, for when I speak of Jesus, I'm speaking of you. But you raised to the level where you could make the same bold statement. And Jesus' declaration that he was the fulfillment of Scripture required a spiritual maturity of which most who heard his claim were not capable of understanding. He was the fulfillment of Scripture. The purpose of life is to fulfill Scripture. Now tonight we're going to speak of conception, which leads towards the fulfillment of Scripture but it cast its shadow in this world. And in this world, we can use the same technique to realize our objectives in this world of Caesar. There's only one spirit in this world. The spirit of man and the spirit of God are one and the same. Now here we come to the first great conception, the conception of God. It's told really in the Old Testament, but that is a foreshadowing. You would never use it as a parallel to the story in the book of Luke. In the first chapter of Luke, the angel of the Lord speaks to Mary and tells her, Fear not, for you have found favor with God, and you shall conceive and bear a son, and call his name Jesus. And she wonders, How is this thing possible since I do not have a husband? Or as it is translated in other books, I know not a man. The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Luke 1, 26-35 Well, here he explains the theory of supernatural conception. The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Well, the phrase come upon you in the word overshadow are the same thing by definition. It means a superimposition to the superimposed upon something leaving your imprint, leaving your seal. Now in the 33rd chapter of the book of Exodus, there's a story told concerning where the Lord is speaking to Moses and he said, I will put you in a cleft of the rock and cover you with my hand. And when my glory passes by, I will remove my hand, and then you will see my back. Verses 22 and 23. You cannot see my glory, you'll see my back. Well, he puts him in the cleft of a rock. Now, when you read that, you wouldn't think it's the parallel of the story of the angel and Mary, but it's the identical story. Only the one in the Old Testament is an adumbration. It's a foreshadowing in a not altogether conclusive or immediately evident way. He's on a rock, a cleft of a rock. The word cleft by definition in Hebrew means to bore, to penetrate, to pierce, a quarry. I will cover you with my hand. The word to cover means specifically copulation. Here is a creative act. Just as in the New Testament, he will overshadow you means a superimposition of oneself upon a being. It's a creative act. Now, to illustrate it, let me share with you an experience of a friend who is here tonight. On the 5th of March, only a few days ago, 
just about a week ago. This was her experience. I found myself awake within a dream, fully awake as I am here, but I knew it was a dream. Yet I am awake within the dream. I'm in a huge room. It was brilliantly lit, sterile. It was so bright, and yet there was a sense of sterility about it. I knew it to be a morgue. I was flat on my back on a slab. To my left were many girls, each on a slab, and they appeared to be dead. There was a physician present, and there was a nurse. The nurse had very black hair. I knew that the physician had union with all these girls to my left, and they were dead. Yet he had union with all of them, and I knew I was next. Then came through the door this vivacious young girl and took the slab next to me on the right. I said to her, where's the physician's wife? She said, she's asleep in the next room. With this, the nurse smiled. As she smiled, I recognized who she was. She was wearing a wig. That was not her hair. She doesn't have that black hair, but that was a wig. As she smiled, I knew she was the physician's wife because this lady knows both the physician and his wife in this world. Then said this vivacious young girl to my right, if you don't want him, I'll take him. Then she said, I set up and I was angry. I said, oh no, it's my turn and I will take him. And I'm ready and I'm willing and able. Then union took place and she said to herself, why? He is like a stallion. How does he do it? And with that, here is the end of the vision. You may think it doesn't have meaning. It has tremendous meaning. May I tell you in order to understand what God is saying to man, for he speaks to man in vision, in dream. Here is a vision because she was awake within the dream. I'll make myself known unto you in vision. I'll speak with you in a dream. Numbers 12.6 it's difficult to tell man that God is man. His creative power is personalized as man. Anyone raised from the dead and incorporated into the body of God is Jesus Christ. For Jesus Christ is the power of God, the creative power of God, and the wisdom of God. And he is about creating. Yet, he had union with them. All things are possible to God by burying himself his creative power in them, he turned death into sleep and sleep into wakefulness and wakefulness into resurrection. She said, there were only four of us who were awake, the doctor, his wife, myself, and this vivacious girl. So here to her left were all these who were already on the slabs as Moses was on the rock and the cleft. It means to bore, to pierce, to penetrate a quarry as though they were simply made of marble. This is the world of death, and God sends his creative power into the world of death and penetrates the dead, and then they conceive and proving to themselves that they have conceived by God, they bear his child. You shall conceive and bear and call him Jesus. The word Jesus is Jehovah, the same thing, Joshua, Jesus, Jehovah, the same root in Hebrew because the word means salvation. So if the child to be born of you shall be called holy, the son of God, if he's the son of God, well then God must have fathered him. Can't be the son of God were he not fathered by God. When you are raised from this world of death, you are used, not everyone is, you are used as his creative power to impregnate the dead and bring them out as God. It seems insane on a certain level, but I am telling you what I know. So just as God impregnates the dead and brings it out, on this level you can impregnate a state that is dead until you enter it. So if the spectator would only enter into the image in his imagination, approaching it on his fiery chariot of imaginative power, Blake visions of the last judgment. So I think of what I would like to be. Well, it's dead until I penetrate it. An egg is dead until the sperm penetrates it. It can be there forever, and it means nothing until the sperm actually penetrates that egg. So here's the egg, 
whether it be human egg or the egg of the chicken, the sperm must penetrate it. When it penetrates it and occupies it, it fertilizes it. When it becomes fertile, well then, in its own given time, it breaks the shell and out comes whatever that was the sperm that penetrated it. So you penetrate a state by simply assuming that you are now the being that you would like to be. If you dare to assume that you are that which you would like to be so that you think from it instead of thinking of it, you are in that state. You've penetrated it. Now, just in this world, it's still the great mystery of all time. We know how to go to the moon. We've put cameras on the moon. We've done all these marvelous things, but to this day, no one knows how that sperm can enter the surface of an egg without leaving a hole in the surface of that egg. There was no hole before it penetrated, and there was no hole after it penetrated. To this day, no matter what man knows concerning all the mysteries around about him, he can't understand how this could penetrate the egg and leave no hole, either before or after, for there was no hole before, and none after it penetrated. Well, your imagination is that sperm. You do not have to open doors to get into room if you enter in imagination. Take an entire room and have it sealed, hermetically sealed. What can stop you in your imagination from assuming that you're in it? So you are in it and you dwell in it and you look at the world from it. If you dwell in it and then feel what you must feel in all acts, you must feel relief of all the pleasures of the world. Relief is the most keenly felt. So when you enter into a state, remain there until satisfaction is yours, until there is relief. Because of all the pleasures of the world, relief is the most keenly felt. That means that you have expelled the germ. Call it the germ. It's the sperm right into the state. Now he covered him with his hand. The hand means creative power. He sits at the right hand, the power of God. So he covers it with his hand. To cover it is copulation. And so he covers with him his creative power of his. But then he removes the power you don't have to remain in that state. You've gone in and fertilized it. And you return now to your home where you slept the night before or slept five minutes before. But you did go in and you fertilized it. And then you remove the hand. Now you only see the back of God. Why didn't you see the face? Only a few see the face. The lady who wrote this letter, she saw the face. She was awake. All the others to her left were dead. They were totally unaware of what had happened to them. So when the child is born, it will come suddenly upon them and they have no knowledge what they had ever conceived. But they have conceived because God never fails in his penetration. And so all will bring forth the child who is called the Son of God which is a symbol of the birth of the individual who brings the child forward. She, on the other hand, who wrote the letter was awake when the union took place. So she knows when it took place. Now I'll tell her from my own experience, put it in your Bible against the 35th verse of the book of Luke, the first chapter, and mark it down. On this day I conceived of the Holy Spirit, It'll take you 30 years should you drop dead now. It's not going to stop the conception. You'll find yourself clothed in a body just like your present body. New, wonderful, not a thing missing, 
but you were not conceived physically. This was in your soul. Your soul is God's emanation, his wife, till the sleep of death is past. So that's when you conceived on the fifth day of March. And from my own experience, it took 30 years. So we are told in scripture, he began his ministry when he was about 30 years of age. Luke 3.23 So everyone is fulfilling scripture. Everyone is Jesus Christ. He comes only to fulfill scripture. He foretold what he would do. He comes in, takes upon himself the limitations of man, the limit of contraction, the limit of opacity, and then he fulfills scripture. It doesn't matter what he does, whether he's a mason, a carpenter, a lawyer, a banker, a billionaire, or a pauper. That is irrelevant. Is he fulfilling scripture? For only as he fulfills scripture does he depart from this world of Caesar into that world called the kingdom of heaven. And that is scripture. So it is God playing all the parts. He foretold it and he becomes it and then he plays it. So the whole thing is vision from beginning to end. And it is not secular history. There is nothing in the Bible concerning history as you and I understand history in this world. These characters did not live as you and I live in this world. These are eternal states through which you and I, the immortal being called God, we pass through these states. As we pass through these states, we realize we are only fulfilling scripture. So the story as told in the 33rd chapter of Exodus was a foreshadowing of that which is fulfilled by the first chapter of Luke. Here it is told in a clear manner. So the angel explains to her the theory of supernatural conception. It, as told in the 33rd chapter of Exodus, but it wasn't told in such a manner that one could understand it as they read it. You take a good dictionary, the Hebrew dictionary, and look up the words you see. He covered him with his hand. And then you look up the word cover to see what it actually signifies. And that is the one definition that is primary. It means copulation. But I know in my own case, when a man stands in the presence of the risen Lord, it's an embrace. And the embrace fuses the two. And that's for man. In woman, all the people were women, save the physician in this vision of my friend. So in the other setup, it was simply women. And it takes place in a way that is normal in this world but it's not physical, it's in the soul. And he buries himself, which is the power of God in all. She said, why? He's like a stallion. How does he do it? Because he is the creative power of God, and he is used for the purpose to bury the image of God, which is the seed within him, in everyone, as they all seem to be dead. But God awakens the dead, so in scripture we're told, Arise, awake you sleeper, and rise from the dead. Ephesians 5.14 So it was equated the dead and the sleeper. They were so asleep, they seemed to her to be all dead. But she knew he had union with all of them. She was next, and there would be the next and the next. That was the part that he was sent into to play. Not on this level, for he couldn't play it on this level. That's why he was reversed. His energies were turned up into regeneration. He plays it in the world beyond in a remote area of the soul of man. But the same technique that applies there, which is piercing or penetrating, applies here in realizing objectives. Now my friend Benny, on the 20th day of October, had the birth of a child. Last night Benny called me. When I had two friends I hadn't seen in, I would say, at least three years, and one needed help greatly, and I invited them to dinner. So we just sat down to dinner when Benny called to tell me that he's had the experience of David. And it came on the very day that I foretold him that it would happen, on the very day, the 6th of March. So I said, Benny, I cannot see you, 
but you must write it out for me in detail. But before he's written it out, because he's here tonight and he hasn't yet given it to me, whether he has it with him or not, I do not know. But this is what I gathered. Because I left the dinner table to come to the phone to speak to Benny, he said, I fell asleep and I'm invited to a party. Here I am at a party, and there are children around, and the parents of the children. Then suddenly the parents put on their hats and coats, and they are departing. And they said to me, You become the sitter, and you take care of the children. Well, I thought to myself, Isn't that the strangest thing for a host to do, to invite me to a party and then leave, and leave me with the children? At the moment David comes through, a lad of about 14 years of age, I know he was David and he knew I was his father. And then he looked me in the eye, and he said to me, I know that our father will never leave us. And then it ended, again fulfillment of scripture. See, God does not imitate. He doesn't repeat himself in each case. The same story takes on a uniqueness so that it is never duplicated in scripture. I know I go unto my father and your father to my God and your God. So here comes the plural. He turned and said, I know our father will never leave us. That earthly father left, but the spiritual father will never leave us. So he has promised to write it for me, and he's here tonight. I want it in detail because it happened on the very day that I told that if it followed the same pattern, the chronological pattern that mine followed, it should come out around the sixth. Now I'll prophecy for him. The next one will come on the 8th of July. Then you will be split from top to bottom and you will ascend in serpentine form into heaven. That's when it will happen. Just as I told you on the 20th of October that this will happen on the 6th of March and it did. I now tell you on the 8th of July it will happen. I will still be in the city but I will not be here. I'll be in the city and you can tell me. So I tell you we are only here to fulfill scripture. I don't care what you do in this world. Suppose you sat in the White House tonight. It's nothing compared to having the birth. Supposing you are the president of our great country exercising this enormous power in the world of Caesar. That is nothing compared to what you have experienced. You have fulfilled scripture, two of the major of the four that must take place. Birth from above, then comes David who calls you father. David is God's only son, and he calls you father. Therefore, you are God. Not a thing in this world could ever convince you that you are God unless God's son calls you father. Then will come the splitting of the body from top to bottom, and you will ascend it like a serpent right into heaven. Then later on, two years and nine months later, you will have the descent of the dove. It cannot fail. This is taking place in the world. And so what does it matter? What the individual accomplishes in the outer world of Caesar? When they must, no matter what they are now, go through this. Who knows what furnaces they must go through before the birth of the child? No one knows. But I can say to my friend who wrote the letter, you make a note of it. You may depart this world before 30 years, but you will not falter. So many here, as in Benny's case, he has no. He's only 30 years old, so he has no memory of the conception. I know that many have no memory of the conception because they might be sound asleep when the conception took place. But they didn't choose, they were chosen. You didn't choose me, I chose you, John 15, 16. She did say in her letter, she knew that everyone was there through desire. They desired to be there. It seemed that way to her. But no, no one chooses me, saith the Lord. I have chosen you. No man cometh unto me, save my father calls him, and I and my father are one. John 6, 44, 10, 30. Who can tell the secret of the elective love when one is pulled out and called? And you cannot resist it. May I tell you, when you are called, you don't volunteer. You are drafted, and you are drawn into that state. It takes place. Now, to tell this in a vast audience would be the height of insanity. What is he talking about? I tell you, 
either interpret everything in this world as symbols or simply reject it as illusions. Everything in this world is a symbol. Your dreams, your visions, and the experiences here in this world, it's all symbolism. You either accept it and interpret it as symbols when it takes place in your world or completely reject it as illusions. For there's nothing but God, and God is your own wonderful human imagination. There is nothing but God. There's only one spirit in the world and this one wonderful universe. The being that maintains it all is the being that maintains you individually in this world. Same being. There is no other. Man is all imagination and God is man and exists in us and we in him. Blake Annotations to Berkeley. The eternal body of man is the imagination that is God himself. Blake Lacoon. Now all things are possible to God. So just as you penetrate the dead and make it conceive and awaken it from the dead into a living state to prove that it can actually express your impregnation because it brings forth your child. So if he brings forth or she brings forth the son of God, well then God must have fathered it. It can't be the son of God unless God was the father. And yet she was totally unaware that she had conceived. But in this case of the one who wrote the letter, she was aware she was awake within the dream, which is marvelous, perfectly marvelous. You just write it down. Whether you depart this world before the 30 years or not makes no difference. You will not lose the child. And like the children where there could be a miscarriage, you will not lose the child. So if this physician was used in that part to sire all these on this level, he is totally unaware of it totally unaware of it. He is used and God is infinitely merciful and shuts off the knowledge of such performances. He sleeps soundly. I'm quite sure that the doctor sleeps an unconscious eight hours, but he was busy in what he was doing for he is the creative power of God. As she said in her letter, I must confess I thoroughly enjoyed it. And he is totally unaware, that physician, of the joy that was yours, but there undoubtedly he was not. But he was shut down in this world. I have books at home, sex symbolism in the Bible, and these great scholars, when they come upon such passages, they turn in disgust and think the whole thing is just simply pornography. Well, if you read it thoroughly that level, yes, it is, because God is a creator and he creates. Every child born of woman is God creating. He is the creator. The whole vast thing is that. But when he brings you forward from above, he is then the reversed energy. And the energy now springs from above, when in this world it springs from below. It's in generation, and then it moves into regeneration. Now come back to this level. For those who are here for the first time, this is how we go about realizing an objective. Think of what you want in this world. That's only a state. It could be a health could be wealth. It could be fame. It could be anything in this world. Just think of it. Now that it is just like an egg, it has all that is necessary but one thing. It has to be penetrated. It has to be fertilized. Until the sperm penetrates it and fertilizes it, it cannot break the shell and become what the world calls a reality in this world. So I stand here before you and suppose I desired to say to be in San Francisco. It's 500 miles north of here. I would assume that I'm in San Francisco. I think I know that city fairly well, but I don't have to know a city well in order to imagine a state. But here I know it well. I've lived in so many of the hotels for a month at a time, sometimes two months at a time. So I put myself in a familiar place. Say I'm on Union Square or I'm on St. Francis, and I would just sit in that lobby or sit in my room that I know so well and think of the world 
I would see it all related to where I'm assuming that I am. While I'm in it, I would feel a sense of relief, of satisfaction that I wanted to be here and I am here. As I would do that and release myself in that state, I have released the necessary sperm or energy in that state, which is like an egg. I return here to Los Angeles, but I have gone and prepared the place. And now I will move across a bridge of incidents or some series of events that will compel me to move from here to fulfill what I have done and I'll go to San Francisco. I may have no desire to go, but I will move under compulsion to go and do it. I will have to go, for I go first and prepare the place, occupy it, and then return to where I was. And even though I might resist the going, I can't stop it. I created it. I will move across this bridge of incidents that will be thrown up for me. Things will compel me to leave here and go there, and I will actually fulfill what I have done. I created it. I must fulfill it. Now, you do this with everything in this world. Look upon everything that is an objective, a desire as an egg, and the thrill of penetrating that egg and occupying it. Actually move right into it, dwell in it, and view the world from it. Don't think of it. View the world from it. As you view the world from it, you're in it. Well, now release yourself in that state. Feel the satisfaction that is yours. May I tell you from my own personal experience, there's no power in this world that can stop you from realizing it. Not even yourself. You may regret that you did it, but you're going to fulfill it anyway. Learn your lesson and try in the future not to do things you don't want to experience. But you're going to do it. So everything in this world is waiting for you to penetrate it, which is called in Exodus, the cleft rock. He puts him into a cleft rock and the word cleft means to pierce, to bore, to penetrate a quarry as though the whole thing was dead. A quarry is something that only stone and marble comes from it. And so it's just as dead as that. So you think it couldn't be. You go right into it, but you penetrate it, occupy it, view the world from it, and feel the relief of being in it and the satisfaction of accomplishment. And you've done it. That is a creative act on this level, just as my friend saw the creative act on another level. It frightens people even to think of that because the moralists have the strangest concepts of God. I wonder what they think a man and woman who love each other if they are apart from their so-called holy concept of God. When two people love each other and they're devoted, whether they be husband and wife or not, they love each other and that consummation of that love is that something apart from God? No, may I tell you, I wish the whole vast world could read Blake and see what he thinks of the so-called moral virtues of those who distort the vision of Jerusalem, this wonderful being of liberty. So in everything you want in this world, go right into it. Don't ask anyone's permission. Can you occupy a state? Go into it. Would you know what the feeling would be like if it were true? How would you feel it? If it were true, how would it feel if I and I name it? And then suddenly, how many people today are in Vietnam either because they wanted to or they were afraid of it and their fears came upon them? They put themselves right into that state. My son went through the last, the Second World War, and he read a little book concerning Guadalcanal, and he fell in love with the peculiar headdresses of the natives where the tops were all yellow from the sun and yet black black hair below this burnt top and these peculiar headdresses. He told me himself, well, at the age of 17, he volunteered right after Pearl Harbor and he was one of the first ashore in Guadalcanal. He actually put himself into the state by reading a book and falling in love with the pictures. Now, he didn't enjoy the experience of Guadalcanal, 
but he asked for it. He did it. It doesn't happen by accident. These things all happen in this world because you and I are setting them in motion and we either do it unwittingly or wittingly. So tonight, I want to share my thrill with all of you in Benny's wonderful experience of David and then in this lady's experience of being sired and I promise her it will take the 30 years. But what is 30 years in eternity? What is 30 years to bring forth the Christ child? And so may everyone have it. He doesn't have only one stallion. May I tell you, he has a wonderful stable. Each is his great creative power, but he can only use the resurrected, those that he has raised from the dead, those who have turned from generation into regeneration. He selects them and sends them, not because they volunteer to be sent. They are sent under command. They didn't volunteer. They are sent out to play the part of the creative power of God. Well, believe me, God is man. The world will not believe that God is man. Thou art a man. God is no more. Thy own humanity learned to adore. Blake, Everlasting Gospel, line 41. Everything in this world is man. This morning in vision must have been about 3, 3.30 in the morning. I saw this perfectly lovely six-story building, stark white, with a little brown trimming. As I'm looking at it, suddenly it becomes man. Everything is man. The whole thing becomes the human face. It didn't lose its outside contour, but it's man. All the mountains, the rivers, the valleys, everything is man because there's nothing but God and God is man. So you move into a river and suddenly, if you are awake, it suddenly becomes a person. It's man. You commune with it as man to man. Move into a mountain and suddenly it becomes man. Or it was a perfectly handsome man this morning and yet one moment before, as I looked at it, it was only a six-story building. Then suddenly here is man, and we communed as friends, friend to friend. So you walk into all these areas of the world, and everything is God, and there's nothing but God, and God is man. At the end of these lectures, Neville Goddard would give two minutes of silence. As I customarily do, I will leave two minutes of silence, and there's some really good questions and answers after that period of time. Now let us go into the silence.
Are there any questions? The first question is inaudible. He answers, The Bible is written for the awakening of God in man. It was all foretold. The Bible from beginning to end is true, but it is an adumbration, a foreshadowing. The new interprets the old. The old is completely foreshadowing and foretelling of the coming of God, which the New Testament calls Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the same as Jehovah. He comes to fulfill what he predicted. But Jesus Christ is not a man. He's buried in every person in the world. That is Jesus Christ. So everyone fulfills scripture. And that is Jesus Christ. The minute you think in terms of a man called Jesus Christ, you go wide of the mark. Question. Have you ever been in the general realm of 3,000 or 1,000 where they believed it on that level, on this higher level? Answer. Claire, I have been in all those areas, but it is the same level as this. The year 1,000 and the year 3,000 are on the same level. They differ as to habits and what they eat and how they wear clothes, but it's the same level. Do you think that anyone that you can mention today, name one person in this world that you would say is superior in the use of words to Shakespeare? Name one person. I know we have people who think they are greater and that they can use words far greater than Shakespeare did. He belongs to an entirely different age just by this. But who has equaled him in the use of words? Who has equaled in the modern world Blake in his visions? Yet we are living in a world of nuclear energy, and call that greater than a man who never left London. He never left little England. But what did he leave to the world? So I don't consider that a man who lived in the year 1000 lived in an age that is backward relative to this. There are only two ages, this age and that age, and that age is entered only by the resurrection of those who are in this age. This is the age of death. So the wisest man in the world is dead relative to that age. And until he is resurrected from this age, he's still dead. No matter how wise he appears in the eyes of the world. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in the eyes of God. So I don't consider living in the year 1 or living in the year 3000 to be separate ages. All of this is part of the same age. It is that age that is entirely different, the age of spirit, where you are all imagination and you are the creative power of God, and you are God. On this level, you are clothed in garments of flesh and blood, and here are these garments that are limited. How limited they are, excrementitious garments, no matter all these lovely ladies all dressed up what they call the beautiful ladies of the world, and they're the ten best-dressed ladies of the world, and they're living in garments, excrementitious. You know that? But to tell that from the public platform, oh, isn't he awful? But isn't it true? Truth is awful, every one of them. And if you make a mental picture, as my old friend Abdullah said to me once, if anyone ever stands before you and tries to make himself important, at your expense, and to make you feel little, Neville, make a mental picture of him performing his normal natural functions, and you reduced him to the level where he belongs. And that's true of everyone in the world. Just make a mental picture right away as he feels so important. Just make a mental picture of him sitting and performing the normal natural functions, and you reduce him right down to the level where he really belongs, because in these bodies of ours, they're excrementitious. But you're destined to live in a body that is not, that is all spirit. You don't need anything there, and you can't take any of the symbols here to describe that world. It's an entirely different world. When you leave it at night and you shoot through into this, it's like an entirely different place. This is an entirely different world when you come back. You enter these worlds and it's just, it's a brotherhood, a wonderful brotherhood. It's all brothers and everyone in love and we form one body, strangely enough, and yet we're individualized. Then you come back to continue the work you must do here until the little garment finally is taken off for the last time. 
and then you go leaving behind this world. But you do not forget those who are still in it. So while you're here having a body and you can reach them, you are used as God's creative power to bury God in all that He calls. He uses you as the instrument by which it is done. Then they awaken, and they know who they are. This is the glorious mystery. When you open the Bible, you're in the midst of mystery. It's not just a little book about history. It has nothing to do with the history of the Jewish race or the so-called heathens of the world. When the Bible speaks of the Israelite, the true Israelite is not a descendant of Abraham after the flesh. He is the elect of God of whatever race. He is calling one by one by one, and that is Israel. Israel means he rules as God, has a thing to do with blood and flesh, which is after the normal descent of man. But these two girls who were home last night, and they're of the Jewish faith, and they're over at the Disneyland Hotel, they were telling me they had a huge convention, and all these people came and they were convinced, and most of them are non-Jews, but they wished they were born Jews because they now know from the conviction that Jews are the only chastened people, the only one who will be saved, and they're trying to get in on the side of it. They both asked me, what do you think of that? I said, my darlings, you've heard me for years, and you still ask me for an opinion on that. There is no such thing. Israel is not after the flesh. It's after the spirit. The man who rules as God is what the word means. So the true Israelite is not the descendant of Abraham after the flesh, but the elect of God of whatever nation. That's the Israelite. So anyone who is called and gives birth to God's son is the Israelite, regardless of where you were born, the pigment of your skin. Benny certainly was never born in the Jewish faith. His name is Benjamin, but he wasn't born in the Jewish faith. And he's given birth to the son of God and God's son now calls him father. Well, look at him and see if that by human standards is what you would call the Israelite. I'm telling you what I know from experience. When I told him on the 20th day of October, you're going to have this on the 6th of March, Benny, for a moment, it was such a thrill to anticipate it. He said, no, maybe it won't come on that day. I said, all right, you just forget it, 6th of March. So he calls me up and he tells me it happened on Wednesday. Wasn't Wednesday the 6th of March? And good night. So this is an amazing lecture by Neville Goddard, very risque in many ways. There is some tones here that are very naughty, the way he talks. It reminds me of his lecture called The Secret of the Sperm. He uses these metaphors as a way to explain how realities are created and that we imagine this reality that doesn't exist right now and we go into it and the only way we go into it is by becoming it, by imagining it. And in that way, we are like the sperm that does not make a hole when it goes into the egg. It fertilizes it, and there's a moment of conception. Now, there's some other interesting things. The story of Benny saying that he saw David. As I've discussed before, with the promise, if you follow Neville Goddard, he has the promise, which is this idea you have these visions that occur over a given period of time as you awaken to your godhood check out my episode 1260 days which explains some of the specific dates that he's talking about where he gives the biblical explanation of these dates this is the first time i've heard of the conception being the beginning of the process and for it taking 30 years after that that's the first time i've heard that referred to so he's implying that some of these visions we have while we're asleep, we may not see them. So you, it's possible that we've had some of these visions. He does imply that with Benny, that they can, you can sleep right through some of these visions. But one of the funniest and most amazing things is a new thing that we've learned about Abdullah. I haven't done as much about Abdullah, but I will. But in this one, Abdullah has a fantastic technique. If somebody is acting important in front of you, bothersome or important, if you understood what he said at the end, just imagine that they're going to the bathroom. They're being excrementitious. Now, when he says excrementitious, he's talking about a body that you eat food, you digest the food, and then you have to evacuate the food in, through excrement, through 
whatever means that would occur. And he's saying on the next level that we do not have an excrementitious body. The non-excrementitious body is consistent with the law of one material that talks about the fourth density body. This fourth density body that you live in for 90,000 years in the next density is not excrementitious. It's more energy oriented and you can eat through your frontal lobes. I refer you to the episode called The Last Days, which was chronologically given only three days prior. So this may sound similar in some ways because it was delivered right after that. And he's also talking about Benny having visions of people eating where they go in and just look at a card and everybody has these faces of joy as they're imagining eating some wonderful thing, but they actually don't eat anything. And Jim McCarty indicates in the law of one material that in the fourth density that eating is we create food from our frontal lobes. So I don't know. These are little things that come up, but all of this stuff together is fantastic. And it is interesting. Every time I recommend that you read William Blake, he's always referring to Blake. And I can only tell you, I've read some William Blake already on the podcast. Check out the marriage between heaven and hell. And I would love to do more because that was really fun to record because William Blake is very amazing. The other thing I find interesting that's hinted at is his discussion of reincarnation. He has this theory, which I'm still trying to understand, that you only are a child once. And then every time you're reborn, you're reborn into a 20-year-old body, but you are not reborn linearly. You might go to the year 1000, you might go to the year 3000, and each of them have their own places for your soul and the learnings that you do. Now, that is somewhat confirmed by Emanuel Swedenborg, and I find that particular theory interesting. I have not heard that in other materials, so it's possible. I would only say, if some of these segments of this lecture made you stand back a little bit, perhaps the one where the lady's talking about being in the morgue, that was a crazy vision. I think the technique that he's using is to shock you into an understanding of this power and understanding that it is sexual in nature, that when you create reality, you're having a moment of conception. You're giving birth to something and it takes time for something once you give it birth. As he explains in other lectures, a horse takes longer than a squirrel or a raccoon or a dog. Each of them have their own periods of time that they give birth. And just like your realities, some realities might take 30 years to come into fruition and others might take just days. So keep on creating and keep on assuming states to create reality. That's what you have to remember. Check out the explosion technique meditation. It's also based on this. Check out the big bang meditation. Uh, it's somewhat similar in metaphor to this those will help you to understand how to create your reality. But once again, a wonderful spiritual discussion of the Bible and how it really is a lot different than what we think it is. All episodes of The Reality Revolution can be found at therealityrevolution.com and welcome to The Reality Revolution. Revolution.